Bart's question in, in English, and, and I'll give you the answer to that. His question was, and, and it's a good point that, that you brought up, there's a lot of things in this film that need translation. There's a lot of religious ritual that goes on, a lot of underlying things. And how come that's not translated from Yiddish into English? Now, to answer the question like this, the audience to whom he made this film is initially a, a, supposed to be for the general public. So he wants it to flow like a regular story. So that's why he, he, he just translates things that's more uh, uh, of universal nature. But you're right, there's a lot of little things, and I'm going to get into that, of, of what he did not translate. <laughs> In order for, for, for Judaism to stay alive, Yiddish is extremely uh, important. Um, there was a, a, a professor, his name was Avram Robach, and he was a psychologist, and he did a lot in building the, the library of Yiddish in Harvard. And he had a theory, based on, along the lines of what you're saying, that Yiddish, besides the fact that Yiddish is a language, it's a psychological way of thinking. So by keeping the language alive, there's a way of thinking, there's a way of interacting. It's, it's, it's a world of its own. It's interesting that you're watching this film on this week's Pasha. There's a, there's a midrash on this week's Pasha that, that um, um, one of the things that kept the Jews going in, in, in Egypt is, is that they did not change their language. They still spoke Hebrew. That, that's interesting matters. So maybe it goes along the lines with, with what he said, that in order to keep Judaism alive, language is, uh, plays a very important role. Because there's a lot of things in this film, I mean, I could stop from the beginning and continue on, where little nuances, what they're saying, they, they, basically what they said is maybe a half a minute. But if you go into what they're, what's really going on, they're basically, give, it, 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 would, it would take a whole thing to discuss. For instance, in the beginning of the film, um, the, the woman is going shopping with her family and she buys letters that doesn't seem to be so fresh. So he goes into the back, he says, where's the checked letters? They have letters, because we know we can't eat letters that have bugs in it. So they already have a company that has pre-check um, letters. So, so they, but they, they claim that it's a little too expensive, they do want to take it in. Then you see him going to shul. Now that's also a little cultural thing. They, they, they don't want the people, they, they pray three times a day. The morning prays, the afternoon and the night. But they don't want people to run three times a day to go pray. So the afternoon prayers, they usually do really late. And then you wait a little bit, like sometimes a half hour or so. And then you, you pray the, the night prayers. But it's a great time then to meet friends, catch up on your day-to-day -day thing. So if you notice, when he goes to shul, they're first talking. And then the, um, right away, they stop him out. And the guy's asking him, because this film was in Barapak. They say, what do you think about the Aru? Because in Barapak, there's a whole controversy. They built an area of like strings around the city to be able to carry within the city. There's a whole debate among the rabbis if you should carry, if you're not allowed to carry. So some rabbis were like, eh, it's really fine, but it doesn't smell right. So that's what Menashe was saying. He says, oh, look. And, and, and then he was mentioning this about somebody who, who left the religious path, but his wife was still religious if the kid should stay in school. So that's also a whole issue. Some schools don't want to throw out the kids because they figure if they take the kid out of school, the kid won't marry religious. Some schools do keep them. So there's little little things that, that, that you see. There was a law coming up about how many hours they had to teach secular studies. It's a new controversy. Right, it was uh, correct. That was a new thing with how much time they have to devote to secular studies. It also happened, it happened by someone who grew up religious and then he left and he brought it to the state. So now already they want him to study, I think, six hours, but they claim that if they're going to study, that amount of secular study, there won't be time for religious studies. So they, they, that's also Even though on Sunday it's just religious. Correct. Sunday is just religious and Friday. The reason for that is, is because a lot of public schools don't, aren't, don't, aren't open on Sundays. 
So they, 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 they basically, they teach all the secular subjects besides extracurricular, like uh, art, music, things like, I mean, not that they don't think it's not important. There are a lot of teachers that do it private. You get private teachers, but, but a lot of them, it's just simply, they don't want to have the kids being there for like, long hours in school. They're so already they, there for long hours. Right. So they try making, I mean, some exaggerate, only an hour and a half, it's not that way. It's two, two and a half hours a day of English. And, and the, all the, I remember as a kid, all the books that we had were all from the public schools. Even a lot of the teachers were for extra money. They came in the afternoon, so we had public school teachers. So the, the core subjects are taught. The extra curriculum that you have to do on your own, let's say art, music, so forth. Yeah. I didn't understand the significance of the fire scene. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I like oh, so the fire scene is, is Lagbomer. Ah. Like oh. He wanted to shoot Jewish scenes, but so Lagbomer is a perfect time because everybody's uh, uh, like in, in Israel. By if you go to Miron, where Reb Shimon by Chari is buried, it's all Lagbomer to make a huge bonfire, bonfire, and everyone dancing around. To, to, because Reb Shimon by Chari revealed Kabbalah, Kabbalistic secrets, so. So the Kabbalah is like light, so the fire represents that. So the rabbi you saw, he's called the, the Nicholsburg rabbi. He has a shul in Barra Park. He does, he does a lot for, for youth who, who have a hard time finding their place. So he has a shul for them. But like Boehm is a big thing by him. He makes a huge fire, everyone comes together. So this really happened. This is, this is a, it, it actually takes place every year, but I guess it was a great, Time. It was a great shot that he figured he had. But the finish. transition to it and from it didn't give any of that. Yeah. No, it didn't tell you why. It basically it looked like he wanted to have some sort of like activity with his son. Um, yeah. Okay, and for instance, the washing Negovasa by the bed, mm -hmm. like the morning. They, 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 yeah, but then it was empty. Then it was empty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the there, there, were, were, there were several <laughs> suggestions here that he was kind of going slightly OTD. Is that? <laughs> you say that's correct, off the direct. I mean, uh, I, I even wondered, there was one scene where he makes himself a sandwich. Was that a, uh, was that likely to be a kosher uh, deli or whatever? Okay, so the sandwich is a very interesting thing too. They have these like 7-Eleven convenience stores. Yeah. I went with my wife in Barapod. That's open like 24 hours a day. Yeah. So basically they wanted to show, like if he finished Maru, if he went home, he, he went to, he was probably up late, so he, after this whole drama, he went into convenience store. So you have a few like those in Borough Park that you can make yourself a sandwich. And but it's kosher. Night. It's kosher, yeah. Oh, it's kosher. But it's, it's, it's a late night store. So that's little tidbits of like what goes on, but it, it was also, again, unexplained in the video. Did and it end in the mikvah? Oh, yeah. so yeah. that might be the but I wasn't yeah. sure. Yeah. 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 So the, the, yeah. the last part that he went, you see that by the mikvah. Yeah. So the mikvah, he did, uh, I think it was more like a, a, a like symbol, kind of being like symbolic, like symbolism. Because the mikvah is like, you, you renew yourself. So I guess if the, everything that happened in the film, he wants to move on with his life. So you see, he goes to the mikvah, and at the end, he just walks down the... He's the, going to the shop. He's yep. going, yeah. 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 With, with, the, with, with the hat and the coat. The with the hat and the coat that he wasn't wearing, yeah. Correct. Well, it's interesting, you notice that lady wore the hat and the coat. Because I know, like in Borough Park, like to walk out without the hat and the coat, it's like someone is missing part of the clothes. Yeah. So I guess like to look like a man, you know, they put the hat and the coat on. So I think you're right. The whole movie, he just goes with his vest. But yeah. then he wears a hat and coat. I have another question, I guess, is sort of related to what uh, Hai said. But um, I, I, I had a feeling about the Yiddish that they were speaking, that it had, a, of course, a lot of English in it. but. Uh, more than more than I'm using, and more Hebrew. Is that a is that a transition? That's been, there was an awful lot of of straight Hebrew words where there's a perfectly equivalent Yiddish word. Is this something that's that's happening? Yeah, you, you picked a, a good point. That I'm going to go now into the Yiddish part of the movie. If you notice, there were three dialects spoken in the movie. Okay, the the, the first dialect was what Menashe was speaking. It basically is like this. The, the, there's a lot of Yiddish words that could substitute English, they could substitute Hebrew words and they could substitute English words. But in America, they threw, they, I mean, the, uh, okay, the, so the throwing in Hebrew is common, but the English words, that's what came 
in, 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 in America already. But also the accent, if you listen to people who come, let's say, direct out of Poland or, 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 or Russia or, or Hungary. As of a meal. As of a well, yeah. As of a <laughs> so, like, hi. Right. <laughs> so, so if you listen to his Yiddish for instance, his Yiddish is more similar to, to, to Polish, because he, he finally came from Poland. So your Yiddish is more pure towards the, the, the Polish angle. In, in, in Borupunk, because you have people speaking, let's say, Polish Yiddish and Hungarian Yiddish, speaking to each other that's similar, and in, in English, there's no sounds that have very strong things. So they developed a, a kind of own Yiddish uh -huh. accent that you would say it's similar to, 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 to Hungarian, Polish Latin. Lithuanian. Land, but, uh, oh. The lit is a given the grosser rabbina, the given of the lit. The shvim poil of the lit. The grosser. So he's saying about the Lithuanian. Major Lithuanian. rabbis came from Lithuania. Oh, so the Lithuanian Yiddish, you would hear more if you go to That's what they're talking, that's the way that they speak. Oh, so he spoke three. <laughs> oh, so the Bula. So Litvak. Correct. So the father, Menashe, spoke yeah, Hungarian is, Yiddish. Okay. His son, who played the boy, is, is Ruven Nabarski. Now, Ruven Nabarski comes from a very strong Yiddish family. His grandfather, Yitzhak Nabarski. Yitzhak Nabarski is very into. Yiddish in colleges, and I think he teaches Yiddish online. So what the kid was speaking is more what they call Klausbrach. Klausbrach was developed, when they started teaching Yiddish in colleges, you had to come up with some sort of accent, what to teach it in. So Max Weindach, who was a Litvak, like you say, with Litvish Yiddish, developed Klausbrach. So Klausbrach is mostly Litvish Yiddish with a little Polish, uh, and some words. So the kid was speaking- Oh, the mom is came in Oh, so the grandmother was a Russian here. The grandmother you heard speaking was a more Russian. So there were three dialects that you heard actually in the movie. I want to say an interesting thing of, concerning the producer of the movie. The guy who produced the movie is, is, um, is, is Daniel Finkelman. That's his name. I mean, we, we discussed before that Menashe is the actor and the director is, is um, Josh Weinstein, who, who did documentaries, and he, he was the director. But the, the guy behind the scene is Daniel Finkelman. And a lot of movies that Daniel Finkelman did, like for instance, this movie, and then he does smaller projects, like music videos for Hasidim. If you notice, he has a very keen eye in, in catching up little nuances that you wouldn't see in other films. So, uh, I, so I have a very interesting, you know, like if you watch a Hasidic film, I have a good Hasidic from Isa for you. Two weeks ago on Shabbat, not this past Shabbat, the Shabbat before, I was sitting at Chabad, and, and it was like towards the end of Shabbos, and I was thinking to myself, you know, there's so much to talk about this film, what could be good ideas that I could discuss about this film? I was coming up with different, different thoughts. Then on Saturday night came out to Shabbos, so Chabad, they, they, they have a, a, a custom that if they're married, they show like a video of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and after that, people speak about the, the, the memories that they had from him, or story that they had from him, that is meaning too much of Rusburg. I'm sitting here watching, and Daniel Finkelman comes up, the guy who, who, who was the producer of this film, and I was like amazed. Like, you know, just don't think about this film, and this producer comes up. And basically, he said his story, and then I figured probably why he has a very keen eye to pick up little things. He said when he was a kid, he, he had terrible problems with his eyesight. And the doctor told him that when he goes out in the street, he has to wear sunglasses. And if he's more than an hour in the street, he literally couldn't open his eyes. His eyes were shut tight. And the doctor <coughs> told him that he, he might not be able to see eventually, and he was very heartbroken. His father was a Lubavitcher Chazid, so he came to New York, and you literally see what he's going through to get a dollar, and he's telling the Lubavitcher of his problem. And, and the, the Lubavitcher gave him a blessing that he should be healed. Uh, he, and this is what he repeats. He said it, it, it didn't go by a long time, and he started feeling bad, and he went to different doctors. And I guess they noticed that it, it was a problem with the diagnosis, and, and he was fine. And, 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 and that's why I, I, it could probably be, because he had issues with his eyes, that seeing little things mean a lot to him. So that's why any movie that he makes, like in this movie, there's so I mean, if we discuss it, there's so many little things that he did that just fly by, and you can see that he, he put a lot of head into it, that it should have, it should have a, a flow. Now, I'm gonna just speak about Menashe direct. Menashe, if you go on, on, on YouTube, you can see he has his own channel. And he does, he does more of like over-the-top comedy. You would say like, 
more like slapstick comedy and stuff like that. But he, he puts on a very strong Hungarian Yiddish accent that he hid from, heard from his grandfather because he knows that people might find it funny, you know, because that accent is gone. So, and the way he dresses, he puts on that whole, whole old thing. So I guess that's how he found him for the movie because he's already kind of a, a YouTube star doing this type of work. So Menashe, in an interview, he asked him if when he's doing this film, if he should also be over the top, do his general style. So he told him no. So he said, so Menashe thought that the movie might not sell because people like him for his, um, but he said, no, no, just be yourself. And, and the movie was very successful. It, 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 I mean, I, when it first came out, I went to San Francisco to, to see the film and it was packed. And then I, I saw that it had great reviews and it was interesting. Like, if you look online, other people reviewing it, not everybody is Jewish, and not everybody is even reviewing it from a Jewish aspect. It just touched a lot of people, his, his personal story. So, speaking of Menashe, so I assume he is financially better off than he was if you gave him Yeah, of course. Right. He landed himself a couple of um, gigs that we didn't need to cost it to act. And, yeah, he, Did he get remarried? No, he didn't, he didn't get any right. He's still looking for a shepherd. No, so that's the true. That's the whole thing. Wow. No, he lives in New Square. That's, that's where his casitas is. And he, yeah. Uh, at one point, they start telling Menashe that he cannot raise his child alone. A man should be with someone, should not be alone. And his response is, as a stepmother cannot touch my son, so how is that going to help me? Uh, could you elaborate on oh, that? So that's a good point. That's yeah. another yeah. 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 point that you brought up. It, it, he wanted a mother that could uh, uh, hug his children. So, so, um, so that the thing is like this. So some people like won't want the child, if the child is the age of nine, to, to be touched. I know it becomes big, big issues when people remarry and they have all the children in the house. So, it can, it, so they, they have an issue with either parent is with the opposite uh, gender alone at home. Let's say if someone remarries, the wife had girls, and the husband is alone with the wife's girls. So that could be a certain thing that you have to take into consideration. Yeah, but it's a good thing that you know. Yeah, that's the, you brought up the, the yeah. 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 nominal pu puberty. Is that it? It's, yeah. yeah. They well, usually pick the yeah, age of nine, nine. but correct. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Nominal, nominal yeah. yeah, but why would they want him to get married if the, yeah, the woman's spirit could not really be a, a mother, per se, to yeah. his child. Yeah, but she's just for the house. Oh, for the house. Not for the child, but for him. Right, yeah. to be like a stable, like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Should be food on the table. Dishes. Yeah. Dishes, yeah. Dishes, yeah. yeah. Dishes, I never no. no. But the new one, can I say? Is that Is that a true quote from the time? Okay, the dishes. I think it should have been a better translation. Well, the word is Caleb. It's not this, it's Caleb. Caleb could mean anything, any equipment. The Talmud says that three things settle the mind of a person. A nice wife, a nice home, and a nice object. It's not really this, it's things, nice things. Like a nice car, someone has a Ferrari, and it kind of you know, makes them relax. So they translate dishes, but you're right, kind of is not dishes. It's objects. Question about this. Uh, my friend is asking me, if there's a woman alone, she could raise her kids without a man? Because I know in Israel, a lot of women are addicts, but she divorced, and she kept her kids for yeah. the kids. So I don't think it's applied to both. Well, the answer is a good question. Answering question is, there's no halakhic problem with a man or a woman raising alone the kids. It's just, I guess in this particular case, the rabbi felt that for stability for the kid, it should be more of a family. A family and and family. he's a shlomazel, too. Yes. Right, they portray him as a shlomazel in the <laughs> film, <laughs> right. So that goes the case for the... He's really more of a shlomiel, actually. No, the movie you play shlomazel, but I know him in real life. In real life, he's pretty sharp. But in the film, they played him as a, you yeah. know... Just out of curiosity, so I assume he didn't get his son back. He didn't get his son back. What back. is the, I mean, do they have a relationship now? Yeah, I mean, there's even videos. The, the thing where he jumps out, his son, remember he said, like, young yeah. and the, and the fish. Yeah. So there's a clip that he, he made where his son went to square camp, and he, he played this, you know, it was part of the activity of camp where he hid in a box 
and the son came in not knowing that his father is here, and his father came out. So it's really fled from son to real. His son today is a teenager, older teenager, 15, 16, his real son. So maybe, I guess, eventually, and, he would work. And I think so there's, yeah, I just, it's not like, uh, English law where he could get custody for say the weekend or every other at least so he could be with the Wednesday afternoon. They might do that. I know I know a school in Passaic where that's where they do the handoff. Like everybody brings their kid on Saturday or Friday night and they do the handoff there so they don't have to go to each other's houses. Oh, so it's a good point. There are cases where they do do like they have visitation. And yeah, visitation. Yeah, personally, by his life, I don't know. Okay, his real wife was from England, so he, he I think while he was mad, he lived in England. So I don't know if that was a overseas situation. Or that. Okay, we could look at it as a Slomaz way, but I think it was more like the Mr. Mom scenario. You ever watched the movie Mr. Mom? Okay, there's a movie, Mr. Ma, with the with the with the with the wife goes out, gets a good job, and the husband is alone. It was a movie in the eighties, and basically the whole house goes haywire. The husband can't take care of the kid. The vacuum cleaner is like kind of moving on its own. And so maybe he was he was technically not a shlomazel if he would have been with the wife, but being alone, he couldn't take care of himself. It's probably more like a Mr. Ma scenario, like alone he can't take care of himself, but with the wife he could deserve. It doesn't sound like they gave him a chance to give him any help because he was grieving for his life. Yeah. Right. Even if you notice when he, was, when he went out on a date, he was telling her kind of, it, it, at that point it didn't even look like he wanted to go out dating. He told her he, that, he, he, that the rabbi pushed him through, he doesn't really want to do it. So it was kind of, he, he was looking but not looking. Well, I, you know, I think I understood him to say, um, I'm not sure who he said it to, that he actually did not like his wife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they did not get along. They argued all along. So, he, so I think he wasn't interested. He didn't want to go through that again, right? Correct. Because you see, he said that he felt guilty because he didn't know what would have happened. It better. Right, so maybe he didn't want to go through it again. He probably wanted to first recuperate from what happened and then figure out who he wants to move on. Yeah, that's also a good point. <laughs> Besides the, 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 the seven-day shiva, is there a systematized uh, form of grieving in Judaism besides those seven days? Yeah, there's a three period of grieving. There's the seven days, there's the 30 days, and then there's the year. The year is, and then there's the year set every year. So the year is only for children. The, 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 thir the 30 days is for a spouse. But correct, every year they do the year set. The anniversary of the death, like in the film, like you saw, like the anniversary of the death day. It's interesting. You, usually, the custom of the anniversary of the death is, 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 is to say just cabbage or put the dabble for the omelet. Yeah, because they, they, yeah, it has a meal. But for the rabbi, they make a meal. But a lot of see them also for family members, they make a meal, like you saw with the kugel and the thing. Yeah. Hey, take the kugel, it's fine. I Speaking of that, is, is it customary for if you do have a meal like that, that women aren't included? They might sometimes go. This is a lot of a why they can have. It might have just been a. They said that the woman were at were in somebody else's house. Oh, that's Okay, thank you so much, Rabbi. I really appreciate it. If you have any other questions.